Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Zoom Into Nature, Ohio Millipedes. This evening, Dr. Derek Hennen will introduce us to the fascinating world of millipedes. I am Renee Baranca, the Manager of Conservation, Education, and Outreach at Western Reserve Land Conservancy. At the Land Conservancy, I develop nature-based programming, both virtually and in person, for people of all ages, often utilizing the expansive network of conservation properties the Land Conservancy has protected in Northeast Ohio which totals over 70,000 acres of natural landscapes, family farms, and urban green spaces. In 2021, the annual Wildlife Diversity Conference went virtual. These were the days when we all had to pivot and change formats from in-person to virtual. I tuned in and certainly missed seeing all my nature friends in person, but still enjoyed the presentations. Derek was featured that year since his Millipedes of Ohio Field Guide was the annual species book presented by the Ohio Division of Wildlife. I was captivated by his talk, especially when he covered the glow-in-the-dark millipedes found in Southern Ohio. I've had his name on my list ever since, and I'm excited to have him present to this audience tonight. During tonight's presentation, please place your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. I appreciate it if you don't use the chat, use the Q&A feature. It's easier to track and know if we're answering them. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Derek Hennen. Derek is an entomologist and naturalist specializing in the taxon taxonomy of Appalachian myriapods. He received his doctorate in entomology from Virginia Tech, where he researched the biology and systematics of Appalachian millipedes. He has authored 11 scientific papers and has conducted extensive field work collecting millipedes throughout the eastern United States, as well as in Mexico and Vietnam. He first became interested in millipedes while he was an undergraduate at Marietta College right here in Ohio. After he graduated, he earned a master's in entomology from the University of Arkansas, where he studied leaf litter arthropods. Derek runs the Twitter account at Dear Millipede to spread knowledge and appreciation for myriapods and also leads educational hikes and workshops about the biology and identification of millipedes and centipedes. In, two in 2021, as I've mentioned, he authored Millipedes of Ohio Field Guide, published by the Ohio Division of Wildlife. He is a research associate with the Virginia Museum of Natural History and lives in Blacksburg, Virginia. Welcome, Derek. Thank you, for, uh, Renee, for that nice introduction, and thanks okay. for inviting me to give this talk. Great. So I'm going to try to share my screen, and hopefully this will work. Good. All right, hopefully we're all Yay. seeing my PowerPoint now. Excellent. Yes, looks great, Derek. All right. All right, well, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I see that we've got 80 participants right now, so thank you all for tuning in, and I hope you're ready to learn a little bit about Ohio's millipedes. Um, as Renee said, I'm currently based in Blacksburg, Virginia, but I grew up in Southern Ohio and did my um, college years there. And so that's when I really started to get into millipedes. So hopefully today I can introduce a bunch of you as well and maybe um, get you all interested in this really uh, just fascinating group of animals. Um, if you are interested in these animals and want to learn more or tell me about some cool millipede you've seen, I put my email uh, right there at the bottom of the screen, and I also have a website and a blog that I update from time to time, kind of talking about my research. So if you want to learn more, um, feel free to email or head over to that website. Let's see if I can get this to go. All right, there we go. So uh, I think probably a lot of you tuning in when you hear millipede, one of these uh, are probably what you think of, these kind of small, kind of drab, brown, cylindrical little species that, you know, aren't really all that interesting or unique. Um, and for these particular ones, you're probably right. Um, these are both introduced species that we have in Ohio. Um, the one on the left, the greenhouse millipede, was introduced uh, from Eastern Asia. And the one on the right, the furry snake millipede, is a species that was introduced from Europe. And so if you've ever had millipedes uh, in your house or you found them in your basement, it was likely one of these two species. And yeah, they're not all that interesting. Um, they're not particularly supposed to be here, but they've made their way into Ohio and North America and kind of found their own niches and ways to make their homes here. So these are ones that you'll commonly see. And so um, what I want to try to change today is kind of change your perception of most millipedes from looking like this to maybe looking like these ones. 
Um, these are a much greater uh, diversity in their form. These are some of our local millipedes. There are some here from uh, further reaches, but this kind of covers a large gamut of the diversity of body shapes that you can really find in millipedes. And there are a lot of really fascinating ones. Um, in the top left here, we have a slug millipede. Um, they're called that because from above, they kind of look like slugs. Their body um, is really elongated from the sides, and so their, their sides completely cover their legs. So if you ever come across this one, your first thought is probably that it looks like a slug. If you were to flip it over, then you would see all the legs. It has this funny little triangular head, and it smells like a chapstick. A lot of millipedes have chemical defenses, and uh, which defense they use will differ depending on what order they're in. And these ones just kind of smell like a weird chemical um, chapsticky type of smell. Um, so you'll see these sometimes, and you can find slug millipedes all over Ohio. Uh, in the top center there, we have the pincushion millipede. Um, this is one of the tiniest millipedes in the world, um, only a couple millimeters long. These are native to Europe, but they've since been introduced into the U.S. And they don't have these chemical defenses. They don't have this hard cal calcified exoskeleton. They're pretty soft. Um, and so the way they defend themselves is a little bit different. And you may have guessed what that is. Uh, you see they're covered in all of these cool little hairs. And those are barbed. If you were to put those under a microscope, they'd have all these hooks and really interesting um, features to them. And those are mostly for defense against ants, which will try to, you know, grab these things and rip them apart. But they, their defense is kind of like a hedgehog, not a hedgehog, um, <clears throat> but a porcupine, to where they'll just kind of um, really throw that brush of hairs at the end of their body right in the ant's face, and that'll just kind of cover the ant and as the ant tries to groom itself, it just gets more entangled, then the millipede can safely walk away. Um, weirdly enough, the most common place I find these is in pine cones. I'll go out and there's some pine trees outside my apartment here in Virginia. And if I check pine cones or peel some bark, I can find them there. They're mainly feeding on algae and things like that. Um, in the top right there, we have a flat-backed millipede, and this is part of a very diverse order of millipedes, the most diverse order worldwide. Um, this particular species is the Canadian flatback, and it, in Ohio, it occurs only in the northeast corner of the state. So for those of you who are local to the Western Reserve, uh, you might see this species sometime. Going clockwise, in the bottom right, um, this is a species called the feather millipede. Um, these are kind of, this particular species is kind of noodly. Um, you can see it has these little um, almost keels off the sides of its body there. And these mainly feed on uh, fungi, and so you mostly just find them under logs. Very rarely you'll find them in the leaf litter, but really what they're doing is just trying to get over to the next log to feed on fungus. These, this particular species we only have in southern Ohio, but it has a much wider range throughout the rest of um, southeast, the southeastern United States. But really cool to find. Um, that one in the bottom middle there, that's one of the cherry millipedes. This is a very diverse family here in North America and particularly in Appalachia. Um, this is a species local to me down here in Virginia and it's just gorgeous. You know, it looks like somebody dripped paint on top of it and it has that really bold black collar interspersed with those yellow and orange spots. And what that does is warn predators because these ones can secrete hydrogen cyanide. And, you know, that's a very potent poison. And so anything it can do to tell would-be predators, hey, I'm poisonous, before they try to bite it in half is going to help them survive. And uh, I'll come back to this family in a little bit, but it's, it's one of the most gorgeous families of millipedes there is. And we're lucky to be located in their center of diversity here in the eastern U.S., particularly the Appalachian Mountains. And finally, at the bottom left here, these are pill millipedes. This is a species from Vietnam. And instead of, um, you know, being large and flashy or having super potent chemical defenses, their main defense is to roll up in a ball. So you see the one on the left there, it's, you know, just rolled up tightly. They're very hard to unroll. If you were to try to, you know, take your hands and unroll it, you'd probably snap it in half. That's how strong its, uh, you know, basic rolling function is. Very cool to see. Um, that one is about the size, you know, maybe half the size of a ping pong ball. And so whenever they sense danger, what's going to happen, they're just going to roll up like that. And until whatever danger they've sensed has moved on, they're just going to stay there. And then uh, the one on the right there, it's just walking away because we kept having those roll up to take some photos and it got kind of bored. It wandered away. It was saying, 
oh, you know, I don't have to worry about these, uh, these guys, they're not going to harm me. So there's a really cool diversity in forms of these millipedes. They're not all just these kind of small brown cylindrical uh, species. And before we get too much deeper into millipedes, I want to talk about um, the higher classification that millipedes are within. So millipedes aren't insects, they're their entirely own group, the subphylum Myriapoda. And so within the Myriapoda, you have these different classes. So the millipedes are the Diplopoda, which have about 12,000 species worldwide. Um, it's easily the most diverse group of myriapods, and maybe the one that you're most familiar with. We also have the centipedes, the chylopods. These are predators, and there are a little over 3,000 species worldwide. Um, you know, you may have seen particularly in your house something like a house centipede, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, but then we have these other two classes uh, there on the bottom, the poropods, which are only 700 species. Um, these uh, are much rarer to see, mainly because they're so small. Um, the largest one is maybe half a centimeter long, and usually uh, the size of these things is about two or three millimeters. You don't see them very often unless you're really looking for them. Uh, I kind of like them though. They hold a special place in my heart. Uh, I like to think of them as these little, you know, Twinkies or potatoes in the ground, just crawling along, doing their own thing. And mainly they're also feeding on dead plant material. And finally, you have the symphylins. Um, these are sometimes called garden centipedes. So if you do much gardening, uh, you may have seen these as you're kind of digging through the dirt. They get a little bit uh, bigger than poropods. They're sort of in between a centipede and a poropod in size. And so maybe half a centimeter to a centimeter at most. Um, and they look like these really cream collared, almost translucent myriapods, but not nearly as diverse as the other groups, only about two or 300 species worldwide. But most of today, I'm gonna to focus on the millipedes. And so what are millipedes? They're not insects, they're not spiders or scorpions or mites, they're their own thing. Um, the class Diplopoda, which uh, translates to um, double feet, and that's because most of their segments have two pairs of legs. Um, as I said before, about 12,000 species worldwide. And in North America, we have about 2,000 species of them. So pretty diverse. Um, very cool to see when you do come across them. Uh, here on the right, I've got various photos. These are all species that occur in Ohio. Um, we have the aforementioned uh, pincushion millipede. In the middle there, we have something called a crested millipede. This is the genus Abassion. This also occurs statewide. Um, and it is probably the worst smelling millipede you'll encounter. Um, their chemical defenses come out kind of like their shoulders, if you will. Um, you'll see this little milky white dot. It almost looks like latex. And I always try to avoid picking these up just because they smell so bad. Um, you know, the, the smell will just stick to your hands for a couple of days, no matter how many times you wash them. So particularly if I'm going to be eating dinner soon, I don't pick these guys up, but totally harmless. Um, like all the other millipedes you'll encounter in Ohio, they're feeding on things like dead plants, dead leaves, they're going to live within logs, or feed on fungi, algae, those sorts of things. And so mostly what they're doing is living in forests, but there are also species that are more adapted to grasslands, even deserts. So pretty much wherever you go, if you're in some sort of natural habitat, you stand a pretty good chance of being able to find a millipede. There we go. And just to a common question that I get is, oh, well, how do you tell the difference between a millipede and a centipede? Um, at this point, for me, it's kind of like, oh, well, it's just the way they look. They're the way they are. But one of the easiest ways to tell is to see how many legs are on each body segment. So like I said before, for millipedes, they usually have two pairs on each of their segments, and I've highlighted them with those yellow arrows there. And centipedes, like this one on the right, they just have one pair of legs on each of their body segments. Um, another easy way to tell is that when you uncover a millipede, usually they're going to be pretty slow moving, they're just going to stay there. Um, but if you uncover a centipede, it's going to be pretty fast, it's going to try to run away from you. And so that's kind of a um, easy way to tell if you don't want to get close and try to count all their legs. So if it's fast and runs away, it's a centipede. If it's kind of slow and hungers down, it's more likely to be a millipede. And you know, I'm not going to talk about centipedes too much, but it is a group that I really like, um, particularly over the past few years. I've been uh, delving pretty deeply into these, and they're really these misunderstood predators, because whenever I mention centipedes to someone, I get, you know, these horrified gasps like, oh, no, I hate centipedes. But and really, I think the same with millipedes, all the legs kind of freak people out sometimes. Um, but, you know, I hope maybe at the end of this presentation, you'll be a little less freaked out because they really are misunderstood predators. Um, at this point, 
I've seen thousands and thousands of centipedes. Not one of them has tried to attack me or kind of run at me. Um, anytime I found a centipede, they try to run away from me as fast as they can. You know, they're not trying to attack you. You're so much bigger than them that they don't even see you as prey. They see you as the predator and they're going to want to try to get away from you. Um, here in Ohio and uh, the greater U.S., we have four orders of centipedes. In the top left here, we have the stone centipedes, and these are mostly under stones, under rocks. It's a very understudied group here in North America, and we haven't had an expert in these uh, this group of organisms for probably about 40 years or so. So there's a lot of work to be done there, but they're very charismatic little things. The biggest one is only going to be about an inch and a half. So most of what are out there, they're kind of these smaller things down in the leaf litter, but acting as very important predators. In the top right, we have what are called the bark centipedes or sometimes the tropical centipedes. If you've ever seen these nature documentaries that talk about these giant foot long tropical centipedes that you know eat bats or can take down small rodents or small vertebrates, it's gonna be one of these tropical centipedes. Here in Ohio, the biggest one is only about as long as your finger. And even if it were to bite you, it only hurt about as much as a wasp sting. So, you know, they're not anything to be scared of. Um, usually they're not gonna be all that large, but these are really the only centipedes in Ohio that could give you a little bite. In the bottom left here, we have the soil centipedes. So for those of you who are gardeners, if you've seen a very long stringy centipede, it's probably one of these. Um, these are the centipedes with the most pairs of legs worldwide. Um, there's a species with 161 pairs, and so um, these are going to be the ones that have all those legs, but they're pretty tiny, pretty stumpy. In that photo, you can see a little bit of my thumb creeping in on the picture. So these, at their longest, are probably only about, you know, inch and a half, maybe two inches, and their, um, t their mandibles and their forcipules, their venom jaws, are just too small to even pierce your skin. So you can pick these up, no problem. Um, in the bo bottom right, that might be the species of centipede you're most familiar with. This is the house centipede. This has been introduced from Europe. Um, I, uh, you know, whenever I find one of these in my apartment, I jump for joy. I think it's great. You know, they're great roommates. They're out there eating um, other bugs you don't want in your house. They're kind of, you know, paying rent by eating all the bugs that you don't want to be there. And they're going to really like to be in basements, bathrooms, kind of moist, dark areas. Um, maybe not... The best thing when you kind of lumber into the bathroom at 3 a.m., turn on the light and you see one of these in your sink. But again, this isn't anything that's going to hurt you. Interestingly enough, though, there has recently been a second species found in the eastern U.S., um, which has been introduced from eastern Asia. The first report of it was from the Dayton area, but it's almost definitely more widespread and it'll probably be popping up in other places in Ohio. So that's kind of exciting. So moving back into the millipedes, um, this is the type of habitat I like to look for millipedes in. Um, I took this photo on a mountain outside of Blacksburg, Virginia, um, and late fall, you can see the leaves have started to turn. We've got a nice layer of leaf litter on uh, the ground. And when I'm going through the forest looking for millipedes, these are the, kinds, the types of um, microhabitats I'm searching in, you know, under bark, under leaves, and some of the things you might find are any of these. So the pincushion millipedes I mentioned earlier are gonna be under bark, um, kind of around streams where there's a nice moist microhabitat, keeping it very wet for the millipedes. You might find some of these cherry millipedes. In this photo here, this is a twisted claw millipede, and I'll come back to these later on. Um, this is one of my favorite groups of millipedes. Uh, they're just super. Um, next up, we have over here kind of at the root, at the base roots of trees kind of right in the soil. This is a tiny winter active millipede um, that you don't get, um, you never see it after April. And so it's really only active between October and April when it's still um, pretty cool outside, um, pretty wet, a lot of leaf litter down. Um, you're not gonna find these during the summer. And this is a species that is mainly restricted to Appalachia from West Virginia down to North Carolina. And we just happen to have them pretty commonly here in Blacksburg, where I am. And then, of course, you know, as you're sifting through the leaves, you might find some centipedes as well. This is one of those soil centipedes. These ones are really charismatic, this bright crimson red collar. And we have a couple species that you can find of these in Ohio. And just to go over some of the um, 
functional morphotypes of millipedes. What we have here on the left is a phylogeny of millipedes. So this is a um, evolutionary history of the group of millipedes. So this is based on uh, mostly genetic data and it kind of breaks the millipede family tree down. Um, if we have at the top here, we have those pincushion millipedes. These are bark dwellers. And so they don't have the strong exoskeleton to where they can burrow um, down into wood or into soil. So they're really just squeezing their way um, under bark and other kind of um, under stones, things like that, these little areas they can get to. And so um, they're a little bit different than other millipedes. I mentioned before the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the pentozoonia. Uh, these are the pill millipedes. And so this is a group of three different orders. And so these are mainly tropical, but in North America, we do have a couple of glomerida. Um, these are tiny. They only look like uh, little seeds, a couple millimeters long. And these are mainly in California and the Appalachians. Um, I typically find them in North Carolina and also in Tennessee is kind of their center of diversity here in the U.S. Um, and these are rollers, and so they're not really digging so much, but they're really relying on rolling up into a ball to protect themselves. And then these next three big groups, the borers, the bulldozers, and the wedgers, these are just specialized burrowers. So these are millipedes with um, hardened exoskeletons that can really um, burrow their way down through soil and kind of make their own tunnels. Um, they can wedge themselves in between um, you know, tree bark or down logs, kind of dead wood, things like that. And that is most of what you're going to see um, for the vast majority of millipedes. But this isn't a hard and fast rule. Um, there are a couple different groups that um, have evolved the ability to roll up into a ball, um, particularly with the flatback millipedes here at the bottom, the polydesmida. We have a couple different families that can roll up into a ball or a really tight spiral, um, which is always um, kind of magical to come across. Um, with the bulldozers here, um, these orders within the Juliformia, these include the American giant millipede and some of these um, Julida millipedes that you may see, particularly if you're in Northeast Ohio. Um, they have their first segment behind the head um, very enlarged. And so they kind of use that to push um, dirt and other particles and really just force their way into um, burrowing. And so that's why we call those ones bulldozers. And so, you know, that's just sort of taking a bird's eye view of how these millipedes are getting around um, in their natural habitats and that's kind of what they're doing there. Moving on to some of their ecology, um, like I said before, typically they're going to inhabit forests, but there are exceptions. Um, worldwide we have species that occur from grasslands and savannas even to deserts. So here in the uh, United States in the American Southwest, um, we have desert adapted millipedes that spend about eight months or so of their um, life each year just under the soil kind of waiting for rains or for conditions to improve that way they can come out and so they've got some adaptations to survive and not lose all that water really the main one of the main limiting factors in the millipedes life is that they don't have a waxy cuticle that protects them from um, dehydration like insects and other groups of arthropods do. So they're very sensitive to desiccation. They're going to be trying to find nice moist microhabitats, typically dark um, places like forests, um, kind of within, um, you know, uh, rock gorges, places like that. Um, this photo on the right here, this is Lake Vesuvius Recreational Area in southern Ohio, Lawrence County. Um, that's the southernmost county in Ohio, um, and this was just beautiful habitat. Uh, I found a number of great millipedes and a lot of um, really interesting things, um, even bioluminescent mushrooms, which is my first time seeing them in person. So that was really exciting for me personally. Um, and what millipedes are doing in these forest habitats, they're really acting as detritivores. So they're feeding on dead leaves, dead logs, and they're mechanically breaking down um, that material into smaller pieces, which then allows uh, microorganisms like bacteria and fungi to further break those down and release the nutrients into the soil. So I like to think of millipedes as recyclers of the undergrowth. They're really helping with soil formation, keeping soil healthy and helping the forest to grow while at the same time kind of removing the detritus like all the dead leaves that fall during each autumn. And so, you know, without millipedes, we just have this buildup of a lot of um, dead organic material. So they really help with that recycling process. Um, one thing that you may have noticed about millipedes as you're looking at their bodies, they don't have wings. And so that really affects their life cycle and their, bio, their biogeography. So 
With millipedes, oftentimes they're highly endemic. They have a very low dispersal ability. You know, if they're going to be getting somewhere, they need to just walk. Um, they don't really have any shortcuts for that. So what that means is that um, species distributions of millipedes are often very um, majorly affected by the course of rivers and mountains and really just on geologic timescales, the formation of rivers and streams and the formation and breakdown of mountain chains. And so here where I'm based and uh, further south in Appalachia, we see within a lot of valleys and folding um, ridges that you kind of get these millipedes that some of them are endemic to just a small area. We've even found species whose entire range, um, as far as we know currently, is only a couple of square kilometers. And so they can be very endemic to small um, areas, um, though we do also have species that have um, really broken that mold and have these very large um, distributions. And so biogeographically, millipedes have a lot of similarities to other um, organisms that don't have wings, something like plethodonted salamanders, the lungless salamanders, um, harvesters, or as you might know them, daddy long legs in the order of pileones, um, various spiders, um, and other similar organisms. And another ecological role that they fulfill is as prey. Um, there are generalist predators, things like um, small vertebrates, maybe birds, small rodents, but there are also some specialized predators, like this little assassin bug here, um, the uh, scarlet bordered assassin bug. It's a very pretty uh, insect, only a little more than a centimeter long, but it can take down millipedes. And they also fall prey to a fungus, which I'll get to in a little bit here. And so, you know, whenever I'm out looking for millipedes, these are the types of habitats I'm looking for. Um, this is, again, on a mountain outside of Blacksburg here. Uh, I've spent a lot of time out there, particularly in the winter, just amazing diversity in the winter. So, you know, if you're into some other um, nature group and the winter hits and you get all sad, start taking up millipedes and centipedes and you won't be bored. Um, winter is a very fun time to be outside. You know, as long as it's above freezing, uh, I'll get out into the woods and kind of see what I can dig up. You don't have to deal with mosquitoes and, you know, any gnats around you. Typically, there aren't a lot of other people out there. So you get, you know, all of this nature to yourself. So winter, great time to collect. But mostly when I'm looking for millipedes, I'm looking in these forests, kind of brushing these leaves aside, digging at the base of um, dead trees and some rocks, places like that. Well, that's not the only place you can find millipedes. You also have cave adapted millipedes. We have a plethora of these in Appalachia and worldwide. There are a number of interesting species from Europe and Asia as well. Um, and this top photo here, um, this is a, a genus called Scoterpes. This is a Cordomatid millipedes, the Cordomatida. Um, their common name are the sausage millipedes because they kind of look like a sausage. Um, Cordum as Latin for sausage, hence the name. So it's pretty nice. But when you get these cave adapted species, they have these different morphological um, traits. Usually they're going to have longer antennae, they're going to have longer legs, they're going to have reduced or no eyes, and oftentimes they're going to have little, um, if any, pigment. So you can see all these species here, they're kind of this pale cream colored, none of them have eyes. Um, this top millipede, Scoterpes, they have, if you look closely, you might see they have these hairs here that are likely used for defense. Now at the base of them, you might see this little sphere, and that's actually this little globule of a glue-like substance that helps with self-cleaning, um, you know, whatever detritus it kind of picks up. Um, the, the CD themselves are kind of fluted, and so it gradually brings that glob of glue up over the CD and kind of deposits it on whatever rock they might be walking by. And if something tries to eat them, that helps to kind of gum up their um, mouth parts and maybe spit the millipede out for the millipede to live another day. Um, this bottom species here, um, this is one of the juliform millipedes and has no eyes. This is from a cave in um, the Balkans of Europe and only recently described um, last year. Um, but one of my favorite cave millipedes is this one on the right. Um, this is in, in a family called Paradoxosomatidae. That's the same family that the greenhouse millipede is in, and its major center of diversity is in Asia. Um, this is from a cave in, in southern China, and just so different from um, the typical millipedes that we see. Um, it's one of the flat-backed millipedes. So it has these very long antennae just jutting out the top of its head, has these very long legs jutting out the sides of the body, and even has these spines from the top of the body as well. So, you know, imagine you're kind of 
some cave critter walking along, you get your mouth around that, you immediately spit it out because it's just so spiky. Um, just a really interesting um, morphological ad adaptation there in that millipede. So super cool to see. I would love to see one of these um, in real life. Now back to the predators. Um, I mentioned the scarlet bordered assassin bug earlier. This is what it does to millipedes. And so it's part of a subfamily called the Ectrichodiini. Um, these are main, their center of diversity is mainly in the tropics. We only have a couple of species here in North America. And this is the species that we have in Ohio. And so like all assassin bugs, it has this tubular mouth part that it uses to um, just plunge into the body of its prey and essentially inject these di um, inject these digestive enzymes and really liquefy its prey and then it just sucks it out like a milkshake. And so that's what it's done here to these two, uh, various flat-backed millipedes. And again, you know, this uh, insect is about a centimeter long or so, but it can take down huge prey. Um, this cherry millipede on the right, it's probably about an inch, um, maybe a little over an inch long. So even when it comes up on um, some millipede that's much bigger than itself, that doesn't stop it. And you'll see that pattern repeated with these specialized predators of millipedes. This next one here are the glowworm beetles. So this is an entire family, the Fingodidae. And as adults, they kind of look like fireflies, um, but as larvae, they're kind of like almost this little slug-like little thing. You see it has these little legs here and they will hunt millipedes preferentially. And so on the bottom left, um, this was a little arena I set up and I put a millipede and the glowworm beetle together and it just went over, attacked it. And so what it does is curl around the interior part of the body near the head. And it has these very um, sharp mouth parts, almost like a um, two very thin knives that it plunges right into the millipede. And it tries to um, cut its nerve cord and try to paralyze it. It probably also injects some paralytic enzymes as well. And so um, these beetles, when they're larvae, they're maybe an inch long or so, but very thin. Um, some of the adult females will be larviform and they'll be much chunkier, but this is how they're eating. And so they try to, you know, attack the millipede, immobilize it. And you can see on this top photo, um, this one is trying to carry, carry away this millipede. And I actually got this on video. So show that now. And so the beetle is right here along the side. And what's really interesting is that it just grabs at the base of the antennae and just tries to drag it. You know, it's, I'm imagining Santa with a big sack of toys and just trying to drag it to the undergrowth to where it can feed on it. And, you know, this millipede is much more massive than the beetle. So just the intense strength that it takes to, you know, grab on it onto it with its teeth and then just drag it over the brush. You can see it kind of gets stopped by a stick that it has to try to climb over with the millipede. Um, it's just a gruesome way to go. And this millipede isn't dead, it's just paralyzed. And so it doesn't completely kill a millipede until later. So it'll drag it under some leaves or some brush, just somewhere where it's dark and, you know, can be alone with its prey. And what it will do, we use its mouth parts and chop the head off, and then it'll just eat its way through that millipede before popping out the butt and just going about its business. And so many millipedes have chemical defenses and those are within uh, most of the rings. But with this predator, this beetle won't uh, feed on the chemical reservoirs. It eats all the meat all around the, in the ring, kind of going after the muscle and everything else, and then just pops out. And it leaves the exoskeleton of the ring intact with those chemical defense glands. So this is not a fun way to go, but if you've ever been hiking and encounter a millipede missing a head, um, it may have been from one of these beetles. Now, I mentioned um, fungi as uh, predators of millipedes earlier. This is what I mean. So this is a millipede that I saw at Lake Vesuvius rec area, which I mentioned previously. Um, this was at night, maybe around 10 p.m. or so. And I just saw this millipede kind of chewing on these mushrooms. And I thought, oh, well, that's kind of weird. I don't see millipedes doing that very well. So I stopped and took a photo. Then I continued along on my night hike. Um, the next morning, I went back out and I saw the millipede was still there. But if you look between each of these rings, there's this weird white stuff in between each and every one of those. And so that, those are actually fungal spores. If you look at its head, even out of the antennae here, these spores are bursting out. And so this is a fungus called Arthrophagia meriopodina. Um, this was a species that was only described a couple years ago in 2017. And it's only been found to hit millipedes, particularly these cherry millipedes. And so what it does, 
these spores are born on the wind and kind of get deposited um, throughout the, the um, various ecosystem that these millipedes live in, you know, generally forests or something. As a millipede is eating, it'll pick up some of these spores. And what we've noticed with this species is that these spores don't actually kill a millipede until after a rain. If there's been kind of a hard rain in the spring, through the summer, maybe um, early fall, um, if you go out after that rain and kind of look on these higher areas like on a log or a stem or a branch of a tree, you might see these because they, they're kind of mind controlled by this fungus to search for higher ground. Once I've made it up there after that rain, the sporulation happens um, within as little as 12 hours because that was all the time that elapsed between seeing that presumably healthy millipede and then seeing this just, you know, cotton candy filled dead husk of a millipede. So when that happens, those spores will just bur burst outside the body, and then they'll be carried on the wind to then um, continue the life cycle. So again, not a great way to go. Um, you know, you don't, we're, we're lucky as humans, we don't have to deal with as many um, predators and weird diseases and stuff as arthropods do. You don't want to live as an arthropod. Too many things attack you. You're too delicious, apparently. But not all fungi are necessarily bad for millipedes. Um, I'll highlight it with this case. Um, the, this is another crested millipede in the genus Cambala. These are about two, mil, uh, two millimeters, two inches long, and they're this really pretty purple color. Um, they also have this just one little line of eyes on either side of their head. Um, these are mainly in southern Ohio, but they get a little bit into central Ohio as well. And so back in 2014, um, I had a colleague at the edge of Appalachia Preserve in southwest Ohio collect some millipedes for me. I snapped a photograph and, you know, identified them and then didn't think much more of it. And then in 2018, I tweeted this photo on the left of this millipede. And so, you know, it's just the head, the first few segments, pretty cool. Um, but then I had a colleague in Europe look closer at the millipede and she noticed something really interesting about it. And so I've highlighted it um, in this photo as well. I'll give you a couple seconds. See if you can see anything kind of strange about this millipede that she saw. It's not very Excellent. obvious. I've never it, seen it. We can drop it in the chat. Does anyone have a guess? Drop it in the yeah. chat. And this is something I didn't notice at all. And I was surprised that she was able to even see it on this photograph. Oh wait, has some kind of a bug on it? That's close, that's not a bad, yeah, that's not a bad guess, Maureen. So I'll show you what exactly it is. The charcoal not, strip, oh, the, the charcoal strip, That's a, so that's that line of eyes. And oh, a lot of millipedes, okay. their eyes are gonna be in like a triangular field. With, mm -hmm. with uh, this group though, they're in, just this linear um, series there. And so okay. you can see all these little lenses. Okay. So it's not that either. I'll go ahead and show you. So if you if you see these little things, they're these tiny little, you know, translucent <laughs> white. There's a little piece of um, black at the base there. That, that's actually a fungus. So this is a group um, of fungi called the Labulbiniales. And these are mostly, um, parasites or commensalists of insects. Um, they were known from a couple of millipedes, uh, mainly uh, in uh, Asia, Europe, Africa, uh, and about 30 species have been described. But what happened here was um, Dr. Ray Bolera, who is now a curator at the Natural History Museum of Denmark, noticed those little um, fungal bodies on this millipede. And she had some in her collection so she and a couple other colleagues went and searched for these millipedes and they were able to find that fungus. And so it was a completely new species, um, unknown to science, and the first um, fungus of that order that had been found on millipedes in North America. And so since they had originally seen the photo um, of my millipede with the fungus on Twitter, they named this Troglomyces Twitter eye. And so, you know, kind of um, etching in stone that discovery uh, based on social media. So that was really cool. Um, it's been found in Ohio, um, North Carolina, Georgia, and also Virginia. So if you see these millipedes, if you look really close, you might see these almost little, you know, when I first saw that, I kind of thought, oh, is it just, you know, a little piece of schmutz that was in alcohol or something? But no, it's a fungus that grows 
on the exoskeleton of the millipedes. Um, this group has been um, described as parasitic, but it's likely, um, particularly with this species and this group that hits millipedes, that it's not really parasitic. Um, they're just kind of hitching a ride. So that was really interesting to see. So, you know, look a little bit closer at your millipedes. You might find some weird fungus there. So that brings me to what do we know about Ohio's millipedes? I've kind of talked in general about millipede ecology and kind of what they look like. I've highlighted some of mil, uh, some of Ohio's millipede species, but you know, getting at that question, um, and this is a question I asked myself when I first started getting interested in millipedes back in 2010, 2011-ish. And so the answer to this um, is that, you know, at the time I was first asking this question, we didn't know very much. The only list of millipedes for Ohio was published in 1928. So, you know, about 100 years ago at this point. Um, and these two scientists from Miami University um, reported 43 millipedes, um, either in the state or likely occurring in the state. Um, you know, they did a pretty good job, but the uh, time has taken its toll. And so it's very outdated at this point. Um, it's got some errors that made it, its way in there. And so this was the only um, real starting point I had when I was an undergraduate. And I, it was a bit difficult to really do much with. Um, since this was published, uh, various work by Hoffman, Shear, and Shelley, um, starting back in the 50s and 60s, um, has really solved a lot of our taxonomic problems. So the um, particularly Eastern North American millipede fauna are much uh, better known. Um, a lot of these taxonomic problems have been solved and we can pull together a much better list. Um, but, you know, kind of reading through uh, this publication about the millipedes and centipedes of Ohio, it's kind of fun because, you know, it's an older paper. So there's a little bit more um, of the personal style of these scientists kind of woven throughout. Um, I actually had the opportunity to get my hands on their original, some of their original field notes that they had um, taken down while they were looking for millipedes in Ohio. And so um, this uh, middle page here, you know, they were at a place called Stoner Woods in Allen County. Uh, I have yet to find where that is exactly. And so um, all these scientific names have changed since then. But, you know, um, what was nice for me is that their cursive is actually readable. So I was able to kind of, you know, write down and actually use these field notes as kind of a basis for a checklist of species and where they occur in the state. You see on the right side, that's labeled Old Man's Cave down in the Hawking Hills region. Um, and, you know, they record a number of really interesting species. And I've been back to that site and actually collected there so I can kind of co corroborate, well, which species are still here? Which did they find that I didn't find? And that's really important to have this kind of historical basis for some of these notes. Uh, they also kept these really cool little notes. They made these little note cards um, that had, you know, various ecological information about the millipede species they found, kind of where you can find it in the state. And, you know, there are these nice little note cards from the Ohio Biological Survey. Um, so this, these were really cool to find, um, you know, some of these. Uh, this one labeled Fontaria castanea. Uh, they say it's in the southeast portion of the state. Um, that species is now known as Ninaria ohioness. And yeah, it's still in the southeast portion of the state. It's not found in other parts of the state. So, you know, there's still a lot of um, really useful data to be found here. And if you turn these over on, on the back side, they have these cool little maps of the state and they have these little, you know, asterisks of where in each county they found these things, um, any other names that they're known by. Um, so really cool. It was really fun to have this actual historical record that I could look at and kind of compare. Eric, on the previous slide, what were the, the check marks or the V's in green on the right? I wish I knew. Um, okay. I've been trying to find, I think, as far as I can tell, I think they just sort of marked off ones that are mainly for like um, aquatic insects or aquatic arthropods. Oh, okay. um, though they also kind of strike through under stones, under bark there. Um, okay. Maybe that was sort of just to, if you wanted to, you know, circle one of those as a method of collection, they just put, you know, under leaves mainly okay. for all of these. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. But yeah, some of it's kind of hard to interpret, but it yeah. is very nice that, you know, it was typed out. So I'm not trying to like decode any um, handwriting. No kidding. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's very rare that you kind of find these historical records, you know, in this instance, written in the actual handwriting of the people that were doing similar work a century ago. So that was just, you know, that just tickled me pink. I was so excited to see this stuff. 
And so that was that kind of formed the basis of our knowledge of millipedes in the state. But again, it's pretty outdated at this point, and the um, identification information um, that they use has changed a lot for how we actually look at millipedes. So that set me on a path 100 years later of getting out and updating the species list for the state. So to do that, um, I just uh, scavenged through the scientific literature. I did a number of um, my own collecting trips, um, doing field work, typically in uh, southern Ohio, and I had colleagues um, collecting for me. Um, big shout outs to Melissa Spring, Laura Hughes, and Mar Mark Zloba, who gave me some really great specimens. And um, I also was able to find, glean a lot of information, uh, observations from iNaturalist with people submitting their own um, uh, millipede uh, photos. And so to identify millipedes from photos isn't always straightforward. Um, you can't always get to species, but you can often get to genus um, and definitely family pretty easily. And so when I started this work, um, I hooked up with uh, another guy, Jeff Brown, um, who's based in the Dayton area. And so we started working together on a guide to the state's millipedes. And we were using as a basis um, these 3,300 records that I had from various sources. Um, looking today, uh, I took this screenshot a couple uh, days ago. Um, these are all current millipede observations that are on iNaturalist for Ohio. And so something you might really notice here is that most of the observations follow the big um, population centers of the state. You know, we've got a lot from Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati area, but we also have a large portion from the Hocking Hills region. Um, you know, there's a lot of great state parks and state nature preserves in that area. People go there, they see big, beautiful millipedes, they post them, I identify them for them. So if you've ever posted a millipede from Ohio on iNaturalist, I've uh, certainly seen it at this point, and I've probably identified it as well. So thank you, everyone who does that. And uh, what we found as we cataloged Ohio's millipedes, um, we started to see um, very particular um, areas of diversity in the state, with most of the diversity being in the unglaciated parts of Ohio, particularly in um, southeast Ohio and further in southern Ohio. Um, over in northwest and western Ohio, where um, a lot of the topography has been kind of obliter obliterated by the glaciers, you get less diversity. But all in all, um, we've got nine orders of millipedes in the state that comprise 17 families with 52 species. And so that's pretty good. Um, and the fact that Ohio does have this kind of variety of habitats ranging from, you know, Appalachian foothills over to pretty um, flat kind of grasslands kind of helps um, increase the diversity a little bit for as far north as Ohio is. And so to break it down in a um, more aesthetically pleasing way, here's a um, pie chart with some of the common millipedes that you might see in the state. Over 80% of our millipede species are in these three orders, the polydesmida, the julida, and the cordomatida. And so the polydesmida are these flat-backed millipedes, including these very pretty cherry millipedes here on the left. The julida, um, a lot of our diversity in that order is pumped up by the fact that we have a number of introduced species from Europe. Um, and so that adds at least um, four or five additional species that we wouldn't have in Ohio otherwise. Um, the species that many of you um, have probably seen at this point, just because it's so large, is the giant American millipede. That's the order Spirobolida, and it's the only species in that order we have in the state. And then we have nine species in the order Cordomatida, so those sausage millipedes. And this is a really great order because most of these species are active during the winter. So that's the best time to see the diversity of this of this order. And so all that work led finally to a field guide for the, uh, Ohio cataloging all the millipedes in the state. And so as Renee said at the beginning, um, this was released in 2021 um, and it was published in association with the Division of Wildlife. Um, for those of you tuning in, from outside Ohio, I hope you are very jealous of all the field guides we have for Ohio because no other state has such a diversity and just beauty that are in these field guides. You know, a lot of other states will have guides to, you know, the reptiles or maybe the birds or the mammals of their state. But, you know, Ohio, we also have those, but we also said, no, 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 we need millipedes, we need snails, we need bees, we need flowers. And I think at this point there are 
over 20 or 30 different field guides that are put out by the Division of Wildlife, and they're completely free. Um, you can get a free PDF of these, you can get a free copy from the Division of Wildlife themselves. If you haven't seen this yet, I encourage you right now to just Google Millipedes of Ohio Field Guide. It will probably be the first um, result that you get, and then you can kind of follow along um, with this presentation even. I put the link in the chat already. Oh, thank you. Great. Thank you, Renee. Yep. And so this is the first update in a century to the state's, uh, not to our knowledge of the state's millipedes and centipedes. Um, there, are there are 51 species of millipedes that are included, and there's also some information on some centipedes, some phylons, and poropods as well. And so this is meant to be um, just kind of a guide. It's not, there's no dichotomous key or like characters to wade through. Um, we tried to put as many clear uh, color photographs as we could in here to really help people, you know, just based on if they've got a millipede in hand or they have a photo to be able to identify their species. Now, excuse me, not all of our species can be identified just from photos, but this will at least get you to the right area. Um, and so we're really proud of this. Um, I'm really happy that it's come out and I hope people are using it and enjoying it. Um, the other myriapods that it talks about, we have the centipedes. Uh, this is the Kentucky blue centipede. This is really only in Southern Ohio. Um, this particular one I saw in Adams County at the edge of Appalachia Preserve. And you see in the background there, there's a paper wasp building a nest. And there were a group of like six of us gathered around just watching the centipede. It would hang from the little rock here and try to swing at the wasp to try to catch it and eat it. It was so cool. Um, so they're pretty fearless. Um, there's also the symphylans, like I mentioned earlier, and the poropods. Um, this is probably the most, one of the most um, charismatic poropods that we have, um, you know, measuring in at a total of about three millimeters long. But again, they kind of look like a textured Twinkie or potato or something. I love them. I'm always excited when I see those. So, you know, if you want to get into these other non-millipede myriapods, this guide will kind of help you get there as well. And now to highlight um, some of the really um, great diversity that we have of millipedes in Ohio, um, I want to talk very briefly about the cherry millipedes. This family is called the Zistodesmidae, and this family is just the Ferrari of millipedes. You know, these are the big, bright ones that everyone remembers. Um, if you shake these up and kind of smell them, they smell like cherries, hence their common name of cherry millipede, and that's because of their chemical defenses. So they secrete hydrogen cyanide, which is that poison I mentioned earlier, but they also se um, secrete benzaldehyde. And that smells like um, cherries or almonds. And that's kind of an extra tell to predators. You know, they smell the sweet thing, they see these bright collars, and they learn, oh, maybe I shouldn't eat this. And so um, mostly when you see these species, they're gonna be a nice um, black with yellow stripes or dots, maybe some red on them as well. Um, this one in the bottom right, or the bottom left, excuse me, is the log larker. Um, they kind of have a nice deep brown, almost purple color with those three uh, orange spots. And invariably, you find those um, in wood, under logs, and that's where they're feeding. Um, this one in the top center is really cool. This is the salmon cherry millipede. And um, we recently did a, uh, a big phylogenetic study of the cherry millipede family incorporating um, as many species and genera as we could find in the eastern U.S. And this salmon cherry millipede is more closely related to species on the west coast of the U.S. and in eastern Asia than it is to any of these other millipedes that we have in the eastern U.S. in its same family. So it's this very strange relictual species that has kind of survived from Ohio um, down to Virginia and north all the way to Minnesota as well. Um, it's a very strange millipede compared to the rest of our cherry millipedes that we have here. And so not only are these things colorful, they smell really interesting, but they also have um, another just, you know, blow your mind type of quality to them. And that is the fact that they will fluoresce under UV. And so um, this is what really got me into millipedes. I went out on a night hike one time and I had a UV flashlight with me because I'd heard millipedes will fluoresce and I shined that just on the leaf litter, and I saw dozens of these things just walking along, glowing like this ethereal blue-green glow, and I was just hooked. It was so cool. Um, so 
you know, particularly in the fall, that's when these things are going to be most active. So go out to a forest at night, bring a UV light with you and see if you can find some of these. Um, it's, it's just the coolest thing to see. And, you know, this is right in our backyards. You don't have to go far for this. Um, so this is just UV fluorescence, not um, bioluminescence. Um, bioluminescence is something like uh, what fireflies can do or lightning bugs. Um, but we do have bioluminescent millipedes, just not in Ohio. Um, the closest that we have to Ohio are species in California that will um, bioluminesce, and those are in the Sierra Nevada mountains. So if you ever find yourself um, on vacation in the Sierra Nevadas, um, maybe Sequoia National Park, you know, go up there at like 3 a.m. and you might see them glowing, which is just phenomenal. Uh, I do want to return to these twisted claw millipedes. This is the genus Nanaria. Um, I spent about five years of my life um, searching in 20 different states, as many forests as I could find, searching for these millipedes. Um, when I first started on this project in collaboration with my colleagues at Virginia Tech, um, there were about 23 species known. Um, as of last year, we have now described an additional 54 species, uh, bringing the total species in this group to 78. And we're preparing a paper right now where we describe another 12. So this is a huge group with huge uh, diversity, particularly in Appalachia. Um, and they're called the twisted claw millipedes because the males on their interior legs, I've got this little cutout here, their claws are kind of twist, uh, twisted and spatulate um, for holding on to the females during mating. Uh, and these are in that same family, the cherry millipedes, but they're not nearly as flashy. They're just kind of um, dark brown or black with some white spots, maybe some kind of peach orange spots to them. Um, and they're going to be buried deeper in the soil. They're not going to be on top of the leaves as often as some of our other cherry millipedes. And if you're thinking to yourself, why have I heard of twisted claw millipedes before? Um, it's because uh, in our last paper where we described some of these species, one of them got a lot of media attention because I described a species after Taylor Swift. And this was a species that I had found down in Tennessee in one of their state parks. Uh, I'm a big Taylor Swift fan. So I thought, well, this is just, you know, I can't pass off this opportunity. So I named a species after her um, because of her association with Tennessee. And a lot of places picked it up. Um, maybe the one I'm most proud of is Rolling Stone. So finally got an article about millipedes in the Rolling Stone. So uh, I was pretty proud of that one. Um, and it was great. There were a lot of memes being made about it. This one in the top right is probably my favorite one. I'm just photoshopping the millipede right on there. It was just great. I had so much That's fun. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great time. Um, so yeah, you know, they talked CNN, Rolling Stone, NPR, Steven Skeep said my name. So that was really cool. Uh, I'm telling so, you, yeah. people don't, I mean, you know, entomologists don't get their names in the media every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good stuff. You gotta know how to do it. And if you're if you're going to name something, you can name it whatever you want. <laughs> That's right. I also named a species after my wife because she's very deserving of a species as well, because whenever we're on a hike somewhere, I'm dragging her along and she's very patiently waiting until I'm done. Um, if it lasts a couple hours, though, maybe we uh, move on a little quicker, but she's great. Well, Never complains. Ho Can't ask hopefully, for field hopefully you named hers before you named Taylor Swift's. Yeah, yeah. It's the same paper, okay, but my wife's comes first. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, um, and then another, uh, back to Ohio, uh, maybe our most charismatic millipede that we have in the state is the giant American millipede or ironworm. Um, this is a just beautiful species. It gets to be about five inches long. There it is on my hand there to give you a sense of scale. And they've got these cute little faces. You know, how can you not love a face like that? Um, in the top left here, um, this is a part of their ecology I want to highlight. Uh, these millipedes are fantastic mothers because she's lying on a big pile of her own poop right there. But it's not just poop because when these millipedes go to lay eggs, what she does is she takes that egg and she covers it in a mixture of her soil and her feces. So that's what we see in the bottom left here. That's one of her poop balls with an egg right in the center there. And this is very important for the survival of the species because by doing this, what she ensures is that this egg will hatch and it'll have to eat its way out of um, this poop ball. So it'll ingest some of that soil, some of that poop, but it also ingests some microorganisms, some of these gut bacteria that then allow it to break down dead leaves and wood. Um, without that head start on life, you know, that little meal, it wouldn't be able to eat any of the forest detritus that it needs to eat. 
And so, you know, if these eggs were just laid, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't be able to, to obtain that gut micro, those gut microbes. And, you know, we'd say bye bye to the species. So, you know, that's dedication from the mother right there. You can see she's sitting on a big pile. This is a crop photo. The pile was even bigger. Um, she can lay anywhere between 50 and 200 eggs at one time. So great species. If you're hiking, particularly in the early spring, you'll probably come across these. And a really exciting thing about millipedes, and this is one of the things that got me into millipedes um, way at the beginning, is that new species are everywhere. Um, this is a species that isn't even in the Ohio millipede guide because it was described after the guide came out. This is Rudaloria cherie, uh, described by Paul Merrick in 2021 as part of a um, larger uh, phylogenetic uh, research we were doing on this family. And this is only known from Northeast Ohio. Uh, Paul actually found it on his wedding day. He had gone on a little walk and he came across this species. And so he named it after his wife, Charity. And you can see here, this map from my naturalist is actually the best map that we have on the range of this species because it's large enough and distinctive enough to be um, not only noticed by people, but photographed and posted online. And we can identify it just based on those photos. And so it's really centered around, you know, Cuyahoga Valley National Park, kind of associated Metro Park lands. Um, there's this outer rim kind of from Painesville down going towards Kent. There's also a record from Youngstown, which I would love to get a specimen from there to really confirm that, because that could even be a different species um, closer to the Pennsylvania border. And so by with people submitting their observations to iNaturalist, this is helping to give us a better idea of where the species lives. And so this isn't, you know, this is the 52nd species that we know of from Ohio, but it's not even um, the last uh, new species that we know of in the state. So this was a couple years ago. Um, I was hiking around with some friends in uh, southeastern Ohio in the Wayne National Forest and kind of some land that my friend had near there. And I flipped a rock and I found this millipede. Um, this is a genus called Pseudotremia. There's about 80 species in this genus and it's most diverse um, further south in Appalachia. Uh, it has a number of cave adapted species that have kind of pale collars, no eyes, long antennae, um, all the works. But they're also surface dwelling species. We know of one species in Ohio down in Lawrence County, um, which also occurs in Indiana, but this was, you know, totally unex unexpected finding it in Washington County, and this is a new species. Uh, this photo on the right here, um, this is a photo of the structures that most millipedes have called gonopods. These are present in males of most orders of millipedes, and these are actually modified legs that are used for sex. And so they're species specific, and so when we look at the gonopods, we can use that to infer if this is a new species or not. And I compared these gonopods with all 80 other known species of this genus, and this is a new species. And so, um, you know, I was super excited. I was not expecting to find it. And it was in the, mid in the middle of summer when I found it. Um, but just, you know, I was so jazzed. And the gonopods are really cool looking. They're almost like, you know, some weird long nosed deer with a bunch of antlers on it. So um, that'll be really fun to describe. Uh, but then a couple years later, I was um, on a nature trail behind my old elementary school. So this is Little Hawking Elementary um, in the small village of Little Hawking in Washington County. This is where I grew up. I spent nine years in this school um, and it's located here in the map I put on there for you. Um, it's between Athens and Marietta, right on the border with West Virginia. If you know where Parkersburg is, it's kind of between all those three cities. And so the school at this point um, is no more. It was torn down. And this is now a community park with um, ball fields, a walking uh, trail, and just kind of community use. Um, most applicable to me, however, is this little nature trail behind the school itself. Um, it's a little bit more overgrown now than it used to be. Um, so you wouldn't even know it's there unless you'd been on it before because the entrances are just all overgrown now. But there's a lot of really great millipedes there, including that new species of Pseudotremia. Um, I was here with my wife the day before Christmas and ended up finding a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, you know, this is just, it's really gorgeous habitat. It follows a little stream down into the sandstone gorge and then kind of flattens out to this periodically flooding wetland. And, you know, there are these nice big sandstone cliffs, you know, you look, it looks like you're kind of out in the middle of nowhere, but there's a highway right behind these cliffs. So you don't feel like you're too 
um, far from civilization. But this was a new locality for that new species of Pseudotremia. And also up here, um, this is another chordomatid millipede, one of those sausage millipedes, a genus called Conotyla, the winter chill millipedes, because they're really only active during the winter. Um, this was a new county record for a species that was only known previously from the Lancaster area and hadn't been collected for 100 years. So I found a new species back there, a new county record, the first one in 100 years, and another new county record for Striaria, which was only known in the state from Adams County previously. And it was just a bonanza of just these, you know, very rarely found millipedes. And not only millipedes, I found a new state record for a tiny um, daddy long legs that looks like a mite. Um, I found new records for centipedes that were only known from North Carolina and Tennessee. Just an amazing uh, patch of biodiversity, but just no one had really ever looked for millipedes and centipedes back there. And so that really gets at just how easy it is to discover these really good um, species that sometimes haven't been seen for an entire century. And so, you know, that that's another thing that just keeps me going. Um, there's so many things still left to discover. And so with the time I have left, I just want to highlight, you know, if you want to look for myriapods, how would you do that? Um, and so it's really, uh, if any of you are birders, um, you may have some expensive um, binoculars or other field gear. The field gear you need for millipedes, it's cheap, it's easily available. The methods you use are pretty easy as well. You're really just going out to the woods, flipping locks, uh, excuse me, flipping logs, you're looking under rocks and under leaf litter. So my main thing that I, my main tool I use for this is just an $8 garden claw that I got from a big box store. Um, it's just a garden cultivator. It's got three prongs on it, moves all the leaves around. It's super easy to use. It's great. And so if you're looking during the spring and the fall when millipedes are most um, active, uh, you have a very good chance of finding some really interesting species and possibly also some rare species, maybe even new species. And so when I'm out collecting, you know, I am flipping over logs or flipping over rocks, looking at all the soil impacted there. And I'm also I'm using something like an aspirator. You can see one around my neck in this photo on the right. And this big weird thing I'm using is a um, litter sifter. And so this is just a canvas bag that has a um, grid inside of it. I throw a bunch of leaves on top, shake it around, and the bottom is tied. And so I then empty the sifted litter into a bag which I can process later. So what that looks like, you know, I'm holding an aspirator here. You put the rubber tube in your mouth. You put the metal tube by the thing you're trying to suck up. And then you just, you know, suck on it like a straw. And whatever you're trying to collect goes into this little plastic tube. Uh, I use this for stone centipedes, which are very fast. So they're most easily collected with an aspirator. Uh, this is what the inside of the litter sifter looks like. It just has this nice little metal mesh there. And that keeps out larger detritus like leaves and sticks. And I empty that into a pillowcase I bought for 50 cents at Goodwill, and I've got this sifted litter. And so within that sifted litter, not only do you have millipedes, you have little spiders, beetles, all these other insects, a lot of really cool stuff that you just never see because it's so tiny. So you really have to be looking for a lot of these species to be able to find them. And once I have that litter, I use what's called a Berlazi funnel. Um, which is a method that was only invented about a hundred years ago. So still relatively new. Um, and what this is, you kind of get um, a funnel, you put a little metal grid on it, you put the leaf litter in there, and inside of this, there's a funnel that goes down into this um, little cup of alcohol. And you get your bugs in there, uh, you put a light on top of it, which adds heat and light, driving all the critters down through that grid, and then you get a nice um, cup of bugs. And so that's what this looks like. You know, I'm holding these vials here. We've got some dirt, some little bugs in there. Some You can see a spider there waving. And then I separate the millipedes and the centipedes from that and kind of sort through those separately. And so at the end of this process, this is what I have. I have this nice little collection of various millipedes, centipedes, whatever else I'm interested in. And then I can further sort those from there. But it's a really great way to really get to know all these bugs that are around you that you just never even heard of before. And I like to do this a lot. Um, here is a collage of all these different critters that I found by doing one of these Berlazi samples in the winter um, just outside of Blacksburg. 
So there's this weird little, this is a rove beetle in the family Staphylinidae. They feed on little um, patches of fungus. They're not very common to see. This thing is maybe five millimeters long at most. And so by doing this, you're seeing a lot of beetles, uh, millipedes. This is a mite um, th that's only active in the winter. And it's really, if you do any of these Blazy uh, funnel or just litter sifting, studies and really just, you know, kind of seeing what's out there, your mind will be blown. It's a bunch of organisms you've never even heard of, never seen before, and it's hard to find information for. But it's really rewarding to really, you know, literally get the dirt under your fingers and see what's all around you. Um, here's another one. This is from uh, a mountain outside of Blacksburg. All of the fauna that I have highlighted with a blue star are only active in the winter. Um, this one in the top left is a species called Cladogonid fidelator. This is only the third time it's ever been collected. And as far as I can tell, the first time it's been collected in about 60 years. Um, you know, these other things are only active in the winter. Um, Geophilus cayugi, the soil centipede. This is a new county record for Virginia. It's another uncommonly collected species. And so, you know, not only if you do, uh, if you start looking through the leaf litter around you, um, if you're looking at it during the winter, you're going to come across a lot of rare things that aren't seen very commonly simply because no one else is looking. And so um, that's more of what I want to do in the future. Uh, and I really want to encourage you as well to start looking for these things, paying a little bit of attention because we really need more eyes out looking for millipedes, centipedes, any of these other leaf litter organisms. Because with some of these, we don't know if they're truly rare or if people just aren't looking and so they're common, but we just don't know it. Um, but, you know, I'll get asked a question sometimes, you know, are there any millipedes that are in danger of, you know, going extinct or, um, you know, having their habitat being lost? And for most species, we don't really know. And so we need people looking for them so that we can assess, you know, do we need to um, put a lot of resources into the, cons the conservation of these animals or are they doing okay? And so for many, many of these species, the ranges aren't well documented. Um, here's a couple of the maps from the um, Ohio Millipede Guide. You know, some of them three counties. Uh, this one on the right is one county in the case of Striaria. And, you know, we don't know, are they actually distributed over Southern Ohio? And we just don't know, um, but it's tough to get these data. And so, you know, I hopefully, maybe I've gotten through to some of you and maybe I've lit a fire to really try to learn what bugs are around you. And that's one of the most um, edifying things that's come from my research on millipedes and other soil organisms. Um, it's made me, uh, it's helped me to set down roots in the areas that I'm in because I'm really, I'm getting to know some of this fauna very well. It's getting me out into nature, kind of seeing what's around. And it kind of reminds me, you know, you don't have to go far and wide. You don't have to fly thousands of miles to see really cool nature because in the case of millipedes and, and centipedes, it's literally in our backyards. And that's a powerful connection that you can have to your local nature, and you don't have to spend a lot of money to do so. And, you know, I'd encourage you, especially if you're interested in this stuff, start looking during the late fall and winter when other people, when no one's really looked before, because that's where a lot of new discoveries are being made. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, if you haven't already, search for that Ohio Millipede Guide. The PDF that's online is in, in super high quality, but uh, if you want the high definition photos, you can order a copy of the guide from the Ohio Division of Wildlife, and I'm sure they'd be happy to send it to you. Um, if you wanna talk to me more about millipedes or centipedes, or maybe send me some that you collect, um, I've got my email right there, uh, my website, feel free to um, you know, contact me. Um, or if you just want a millipede identified, put it on iNaturalist and I'm sure I'll see it eventually. And Great. with that, um, I hope we have time for questions. We sure do, Derek, and we have awesome. quite a few questions here. Um, segueing from your iNaturalist conversation, um, there was a question about what makes a good voucher photo for a millipede. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, for those of you who take voucher photos, um, particularly with insects like dragonflies, I know a lot of people will take um, photos of the posterior end of the, of the insect. With millipedes, it's not really the same. Um, they don't typically have species characters that are um, very important at the end of their body, but I'd recommend getting a nice dorsal photo. Um, try to get a good macro photo. You know, don't 
hold the mill if the millipede is on the sidewalk get down to its level don't just you know take a photo from uh, your head height um, but get a nice dorsal photo maybe one from the side um, and just try to get it in focus is just super duper helpful okay sounds good so pretty much so just the dorsal view is all you need to really get it down to species um with dorsal view i can get it to family, maybe okay. to genus. Um, a okay. lot of species to get to species, a lot of uh, millipedes to get to species, you do need to take a look at the sexual structures. Okay. So that's on the um, bottom side of the body and that's hard to gotcha. photograph. Understood, okay. Um, you talked a little bit about non-native millipedes. And so there were a couple questions related to that. Like, are they, um, are they having any sort of harmful effects on our native species? That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, the answer is, in most cases, we don't really know. Um, I would say, particularly in Ohio's case, um, particularly in areas that have been very urbanized or in areas of glaciated Ohio, um, when those glaciers came through and then receded, you know, that kind of really flattened the area and took out um, force as well. And so we tend to see in glaciated areas not a whole lot of native millipedes, except for some of the ones that were in forest areas that have kind of migrated out to it. So in many cases, particularly in urban environments, um, when we're finding these non-native millipedes, they're really filling these niches where we didn't have any of our native millipedes left there anymore. And so I think in a lot of cases, these non-native non millipedes aren't actually having a um, negative effect on our native ones. You know, I'll go out and I'll find um, some places that have a lot of non-native millipedes, but there'll be ju just as many, if not more native millipedes. And so they seem to sort of, you know, be able to live together. Um, we don't see exactly that the non-natives are having uh, many neg negative effects, but again, there haven't been a lot of studies on it, so we don't know. Um, I would say on the topic of non-natives though, the more, um, the animals that are having more of a neg negative effect are introduced earthworms. And so earthworms will just go through forests and just, you know, reduce the um, leaf litter down to almost nothing. And so that takes away a lot of the millipedes food. So we have noticed in my own um, field research, I've noticed if I'm in an area with a lot of earthworms, I'm not going to be finding nearly as many millipedes. Well, that was Brad's question and you nailed it without me even asking it. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> so here's someone brought something up that I did not know about. Can you speak a little bit about millipede mass migrations? Oh, yeah. That's still something I wish I could uh, be lucky enough to witness. And so <laughs> there are these ma mass migrations of millipedes. Um, There's one, even one reported in 1907, I think, down in Vinton County. And so just it's exactly what it sounds like. Scores and scores of millipedes just walking along the ground and just, you know, kind of freaking people out. Um, the species that's most often observed during this is Pleuroloma flavipes. Um, I gave it the common name of the traveling cherry millipede because it's known for this behavior. And that seems to happen when just particularly in the summer it happens. So it might be related to kind of resource availability. You know, if it's too dry, they get together in a big group and maybe um, their safety in numbers and they just, you know, migrate hundreds, even thousands of millipedes just, you know, migrating from one area to the next. But we don't have a lot of great data on it because, you know, we don't know a great way to predict when these migrations will happen. And some of the data we do have is conflicting. And so um, it seems to be that some of these um, mass migrations are mediated by the chemicals that the millipedes themselves are, will release. But we just don't really know why it happens, but it's really cool to see. I wish I could come across it myself. I would just, I'd be taking so many selfies with them. So if you're lucky enough to see it, that, you know, take some photos and see if you can get kind of a, um, estimate of how many millipedes you're seeing and let me know because yeah, I'd love to know more about it. question came from a, a naturalist up here in Northeast Ohio, so I'll have to ask him if he's okay. actually seen it. Dan, put it in the chat if you've actually seen the migration. <laughs> so here's a question about the glowing. What is the adaptive function of that? Why, why do the millipedes glow in the dark? So for the UV fluorescent ones, yes, we don't know if there's actually... Um, you know, any effect on the millipede itself. You know, it's caused by a, chemi a um, chemical on their exoskeleton that just reacts to the, to the um, UV light, but we don't know if it actually gives them, you know, any positive or any negative. Um, 
And there's not a lot of research done on that even. Um, an interesting thing though, is that most of these millipedes that fluoresce under UV light, they don't have eyes, they're completely blind. And so it's not signaling to each other. But what we do have is for the bioluminescent millipedes in California, um, there have been some studies on why they can actually create their own light. And what seems to have happened there is that originally it evolved as a um, trait to essentially off gas excess heat because the millipedes that were doing this were in the deserts of California. Um, but later, um, those millipedes, I forget if they either migrated kind of up the mountains or the mountains uplifted, and then they found themselves in, you know, an area where it wasn't as hot anymore, so they didn't really need the bioluminescence. But the secondary function came up of signaling to nocturnal predators that they're poisonous. So if something like some kind of small mouse were to see them glowing, eventually it would be able to associate that glowing with the poison of the millipede. So it's a really interesting ecological interaction. Um, so we know that for the bioluminescence, but we still don't know why the UV fluorescent ones do that. That's a question we need someone to go out there and answer, right? That's right. <laughs> so many questions. Um, speak a little bit about the life cycle of millipedes. How long do they live um, in their adult stages and about egg laying and that sort of thing, Derek? Yeah, so it kind of varies depending on the millipede, of course, but you know, okay. they start out as the egg, they hatch. Um, most millipedes, when they hatch, they only have three pairs of legs. So that's kind of, it's very cute to see. Um, and most of their life is really spent in this juvenile stage. Um, they'll molt about five times or so on average, and then they'll make it to adulthood. Um, the adults only really live a couple months. Um, they don't live nearly as long as the juveniles do. Uh, and for an average life cycle for millipedes, I'd say it's about one to two years or so. Um, for species that are kind of at more of an extreme, um, we do know of some pill millipedes from the UK that live about 10 years. And that's thought to be because, you know, it's a little more north and also their food source isn't very nutritious. So they just kind of have this um, slower rate of life to them. Um, but we don't have, you know, exact life history data for a lot of millipede species, particularly in North America. Um, if you're used to, you know, um, reading mammal field guides or bird field guides, you know, you have all the life history information you could want. We're missing a lot of that for millipedes. So a lot of this basic work still needs to be done but about one to two years is a pretty good average for millipedes. Okay, sounds good. What about invertebrate paleo on this? What are the earliest evidence of millipedes? Do you, do you know anything about that? Yeah, a little bit. So millipedes okay. were among the first um, air breathing terrestrial animals. So they have a very old fossil record. The first fossils are from the um, late Silurian, early Devonian time period. So I think that's around 380 million years. Um, so they've been around a long, long time. Um, they may have been some of the first uh, animals to even uh, evolve chemical defenses for use against terrestrial predators as well. And so we don't have a great um, fossil record of all groups of millipedes. Um, unfortunately, millipedes, when they die, their exoskeleton disarticulates pretty quickly. Um, they don't hold up quite as well as some other groups. Um, but if you've heard of uh, Arthur Pleura, it was the largest millipede um, ever known on Earth. I think it was um, a, about a meter long. Um, and it, we have tracks from like Scotland, and I think it maybe also occurred in whatever um, northeastern North America used to be at that time as well. And so, you know, if we had those around today, you could put a little a saddle on it, put a little child on, and they could ride the millipede around. But there's a pretty long fossil history to millipedes. Unfortunately, we don't know, know quite as much as we would like to, just because unless they really like, you know, um, were preserved in amber or something, it's hard to find good millipede fossils. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, excellent. Well, with that, I think we're going to wrap up for the evening, Derek. If we did not get to your question, I promise you we'll get to them via email and get answers out to you um, for things that you've asked. Um, but that's it for tonight. Derek, thank you so much. This was so fun. Yeah, Your thank you. Presentation style is great. Um, you made millipedes really fun to learn more about. So I appreciate that's what it I like to hear. very much. Yeah. And everyone, please join us in a couple of weeks. We're going to um, be covering the um, Land Conservancy's Reforest Our City program here in the city of Cleveland, our work to plant more trees and take care of the existing tree canopy in Cleveland, Ohio. So 
thank you and everyone have a have a nice evening stay cool if you're in um northeast ohio it's very <laughs> humid here tonight <laughs> thanks again everyone thanks derek